Let's look at Chapter 5 of Pagano's Understanding Statistics, where we're going to be looking at the normal curve and standardized scores on the normal curve. Let's start off by reviewing some of the concepts that we covered in the last chapter. Here we have some data, and the question is which set of data has the highest standard deviation? In A, we have minus 6, minus 4, 4, and 6. In B, we have 8, 6, 7, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, and so on. And in C, we have 102, 101, 104, 105. Which one has the highest standard deviation? So the focus is on the standard deviation. Well, if you guessed A, you would be correct. Why is that? Because we can look at the range, and it goes all the way from minus 6 to plus 6. We can compare that to B, where everything is 6, 7, or 8. Even though there's a lot of numbers, B would be the highest N, the highest sample sizes. And in C, we have a high mean or a high average. Everything's over 100, but there's not too much variety in scores. The greatest variety, the greatest variance, the greatest variability occurs in A, so it would have the highest standard deviation. Now let's talk about the normal curve or the bell curve. There are tons of variables that are distributed normally in nature, in business, in organizations, in medicine, anything having to do with humans, there tends to be a normal value. So if we were to talk about the, the height of women, the normal value for a height of a woman is about 5 foot 4 inches. Now some women are, are, are taller than that, and a few are much taller than that, and some are shorter than that, and some are much shorter, but um, the, the normal height's about 5 foot 4. Now, the, uh, um, another example would be the hours worked by f uh, per year by full-time employees. In America, that's about 1,900 hours per year. There's some that work between 1,900 and 2,000, and some between 1,800 and 1,900, and a few working more than 2,000, and a few working less than 2,000, but it comes out as normally distributed with most full-time workers working in that middle range. Whenever we do an experiment, like if we were going to uh, uh, measure uh, 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 what people thought of a new uh, process, there would be, the variables would be distributed normally. Some people, there might be a normal reaction like, oh, that's pretty good. A few people would think it'd be great, and a few people would think that it's not very good, but there'd be kind of like a normal score. Now, whenever we have lots and lots of data, we'll start getting a normal score that's smoother and smoother. If we just have a few pieces of data, it'll look a little rough, but we'll still usually get something that looks like a normal curve. Now, here is a, uh, the, a picture of the normal curve, as well as the equation. Now, first of all, let me tell you that we'll never have to use the equation. It's really kind of an ugly equation. It's interesting, though, because it has uh, um, some famous constants. It's math. It's got the square root of 2. It's got pi. It's got e. All of that describes the normal curve. Um, but the important things to, to remember are what causes its shape. Mu, the average, is always what's going to be in the middle point there. And then along the sides, the how fat it is is determined by sigma, the standard deviation. And sigma actually is the width from the midpoint to the part of the line that's actually perfectly straight. That's called the inflection point. Here it's kind of con uh, concave. Here it's more convex. And the point where it moves from concave to convex is called the inflection point. And that is one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the, the mean. So if it had a higher standard deviation, it would be a wider curve, and if it was a, more, a smaller standard deviation, it would be a narrower curve. 
and uh, the, uh, the sample size determines how high it is. The bigger the sample size, the taller it'll be, but usually we're not too concerned about the sample size because we're just concerned about the, the shape that's divided, that's determined by mu, the mean, and sigma, the standard deviation. Now, one of the interesting things about the normal curve is that the areas are always constant for uh, a given standard deviation away from another point. Let's take an example of IQs. IQ is a measure of cognitive ability, and most people are somewhat familiar with it. There's several ways of defining IQ, but one of the most common is to say that the average intelligence of some population is 100. And that means people with an IQ above 100 are above average intelligence, and those that are uh, below uh, 100 have below average intelligence. And the, um, uh, the standard deviation is typically defined as 16. And so an IQ of 116 would be one standard deviation above the, the mean, and a standard deviation of 132 would be two standard deviations above the mean. And that's uh, the same uh, below, and this is useful because, like, if we uh, uh, want to, uh, typically, uh, people that are men mentally handicapped are defined as having an IQ below 70, which means below two standard deviations below the, the mean. And if uh, in the testing of their cognitive uh, ability by a school psychologist, they find out that their cognitive, their, their IQ is below 70, they're often placed in uh, special education classes where they can maybe get more out of things than in a regular class. Well, it turns out that the area of all normal curves is like the distance between the mean and one standard deviation is always 34.13%. And the area between uh, one, the one mean one standard deviation above the mean and two standard deviation above the mean is 13.59%. And so on. We have the areas for the different uh, parts. So like everything above three standard deviations is 0.13%. Now, we can observe certain things with this. We could say, well, this means that 34.13% of the population has an IQ between 100 and 116. Or we could add up these three uh, uh, scores here, which would be about 16%, and say 16% of the population has an IQ above 116. Or if we added up this section, this section, this section, and this section, that would come out to exactly 50%, which makes sense because over 50, exactly 50% of the population should have an IQ above the mean. And same thing with uh, below, it should come, should add up to 50% also. So the areas underneath the normal curve tell us how many people exist between two scores, or to the left of one score, or to the right of one score. Suppose, for example, that a child's IQ is 132. What percentile of intelligence is she in? Well, we could look at the, uh, the chart over there, and we could see, okay, so she's in the top half, so we've got 50% over on this side, and we add up the two segments between 100 and 132, and that comes up to 47.72%. We add those two numbers together, and that comes up to the 97.72%. So we could say that she's in about the 98th percentile with an IQ of 132. Now, let's uh, uh, talk about what's known as standard scores. If the child's IQ was 132, um, we could also say that she was two standard deviations above the mean. That makes sense because um, one standard deviation is 16. 16 times 2 is 132, so 132 is 32, two standard deviations above the mean. We would say that this means she has a z-score of 2. The z-score is the number of means above or below 
the the number of standard deviations above or below the mean that the the score is negative z scores are below the mean and positive z scores are above the mean now the general formula for calculating z scores is z equals x that's our raw score in this situation it would be the child's iq of 132 and if we had lots of children in the class we'd have a separate raw score for each child then the minus the population mean so the population mean of iq is 100 so this top would be 132 minus 100 total 32 divide by the standard deviation and we said that the standard deviation in this measure of iq is 16 so we'd have 32 divided by 16 and that equals 2 so it's two standard deviations above the mean now the nice thing about z scores is that they allow us to compare the magnitude of scores that are not normally comparable for example the shoe size to height if we have somebody that has a, a shoe size of 15 who's six foot five can we tell if that person has big feet for their height no it's really difficult but if we converted them both to z scores and if they were both a z score of three we would say aha the shoe size of with a z score of three corresponds to the height of uh, three and we could say that they're they're very compatible they go together there's nothing unusual there this would also allow us to compare uh, uh, grades, like maybe your stats grade to, your, to an English grade. Um, if we knew what the mean for the class was and the standard deviation, we could take your score, calculate a Z for the stats class, and do the same for the English class and compare the two Z scores to see what you're doing better in. If you had like a 97 in English and an 80 in stats, if everybody's doing that type of score in English, that might not indicate that you're doing especially well. Whereas in stats, if most people were getting much lower scores, the Z score would indicate that you're doing better in stats than in English. So uh, they, uh, the, um, the Z scores essentially give us a measure of how extreme a score is. For example, commute time, if we had a bunch of commute times for uh, students and how long they, it takes to get there, we could convert them to Z-scores and see how extreme different people's scores are.